<clears throat> Good morning. As Jay said, I would like to start off by introducing my colleagues who are here. I'm honored that they're here. I hope I don't miss anybody. Would you please welcome State Senator Mike Hastings. Mike Hastings. I understand Donnie Trotter's here. Donnie, there we go. Maddie Hunter, Senator Maddie Hunter. There you go. Senator Toy Hutchinson. Toy. Kwame Raul, Senator Kwame Raul. Senator Patricia Van Pelt. Jennifer Bertino Terrence, JBT. <laughs> Senator Pro Tem, uh, Don Harmon. Don Harmon's here. Uh, I don't think we, I, those are all, those are all Democrats. I was hoping we could get at least one Republican. <laughs> like we, like we, Dale Ryder's not here, but we thank him for voting for the, uh, the tax. Um, I hope there's no state representatives here. <laughs> But I, um, I, I am very happy that one of our five kids actually showed up. Garrett Cullerton's here. Garrett, thank you very much. And as Jay said, uh, the real speaker of my house, Pam Cullerton. Thank you. So I always look forward to coming to the City Club. Usually, uh, because of Pam Cullerton, I have a bunch of PowerPoints. But, uh, Today, uh, let's just say that my speech was written kind of late in the day because of the developments in Springfield. So um, I, I'm happy here to talk about, um, of course, our budget. Uh, and, but before I, I put everybody to sleep talking about the budget, um, I want to try a little audience participation. And I think I know what's going to happen here, but let's just try it. Uh, if you drove here this morning or if you've been in, a, in an automobile recently, I would. It, I would like you to raise your hand if you wore your seatbelt. Okay, I'm just assuming that nobody didn't raise their hand, right? Now, uh, if you went back to the early 80s, the result of that little um, uh, question would have been much different. Uh, it would have been about 15% of you would have raised your hands in 1982. Uh, because uh, buckling up was not routine. And I know this because I sponsored the law that first required seatbelt use in Illinois. And when you think about it, that wasn't an easy task to pass that bill because I was trying to get people to vote for something that told 85% of their constituents to change their daily behavior. And that kind of change is not easy. And so, in my experience, this is how you do it. You begin with a small step forward. And then you pass that law, and when the world doesn't end, you recognize success, you build your base of supporters, and you keep stepping forward to accomplish broader goals, right? So looking back at that initial seatbelt law seems extremely watered down by what we are accustomed to today. As a matter of fact, a police officer, even if he saw you not wearing your seatbelt, wasn't even allowed to give you a ticket. But it worked to move the ball forward. So now, nearly 90% of Illinois adults say they always use a seatbelt when driving or riding a vehicle. And Illinois was recently ranked, I'm very proud of this, the top state in the nation for road safety by the National Safety Council, in part because of the seatbelt laws and the widespread use. So my point in telling this story is to emphasize the role of compromise and negotiation in bringing about change and moving issues forward. So I could have stomped my feet back in the 80s and demanded mandatory seatbelt enforcement for the front and back seat, or I will never vote for a state budget or anything else again. Uh, but I can tell you what would have happened. Nothing. Obviously, the governor of Illinois has more influence and should be able to get things done faster than some rank and file lawmakers, but governors aren't dictators. They need to be able to negotiate and compromise too. So that brings me to the bipartisan balanced budget the Senate just approved 
and backed up with an override of the governor's veto, a budget that hopefully the House will be enacting as law later today with a similar override. So let's get one thing out of the way. Yes, there is a tax increase, or as I would like to call it, a partial reinstatement of the previous tax rates. The personal income tax goes to 4.95 from 3.75%. So that's a 1.2 percentage point increase if you voted for it, or it's Mike Madigan's permanent 32% tax increase if you're Governor Rauner. The tax rate was 5% from 2011 to 2015. This is actually lower than that. It's also lower than just about every state around us, nearly all of which have graduated tax brackets. So I'm pretty sure, I hope anyway, and I'm pretty safe in saying that just about everybody in this room would be paying rates well in excess of 4.95% if you were in one of those states. Someone making $50,000 in, uh, pays a 6.27% income tax rate in Wisconsin. In Iowa, that percent is 7.92%. But there's a lot more than a tax rate to our balanced budget. I don't usually write press releases for Bruce Rauner, but let me offer up a couple of possible headlines of what he could be doing and saying rather than vetoing balanced budgets. Here's one for him. Budget deal cuts state spending by $3 billion. Rauner works Democrats for biggest budget cut in recent history. That could have been a, a press release he could have issued. How about Rauner-led pension reforms could save taxpayers $1.5 billion, 401k style system to get test run. That also is true. Those are both examples of how Rauner and the Republicans shaped the budget that's on the verge of finally becoming law. There are nearly $3 billion in cuts and savings in this plan. They are there because the Republicans brought them to the table and convinced Democrats that they were a good idea. Those cuts didn't happen without Republican participation. <coughs> the same thing is with the pension reforms. Uh, many of you know I've been involved in pension reform legislation in recent years. So guess what? The governor gets all of the pension reforms that he and the Republicans wanted. In fact, the part that I wanted got taken out. And that's, um, and, and now it's just the Republican pension reform bill. And the governor vetoed it. <coughs> and then when we overrode his veto to make sure the pension changes he wants to become law, we overrode him to make sure that his pension changes become law. I voted for it twice on Tuesday even though the part I wanted was removed. My point is the budget was shaped and supported by Republicans. It contains win after win for the Rauner administration if it would choose to recognize those wins. There's all kinds of stuff he could cite as progress that happened only because he's the governor. Now I recognize that people are sick and tired of the political finger pointing, I get it, I want results too. But I'm left to deal with a governor who filed veto messages that read like attack ads. And this is a governor who vanished from public view for the better part of the last two weeks, just as he has every May when a budget deadline approaches. And it's, it's a trend is developing. Um, it's crunch time. He disappears only to emerge after the deadline with a new set of campaign ads attacking Democrats. That means he spends those crucial times not working on a budget, but working on attack ads rather than doing his job. And given his recent disappearance, I would expect a new round of ads to start tonight if they haven't already. So for me, I actually kind of get off easy in this political perspective because 99% of those ads aren't directed at me. They're directed at Mike Madigan. Now, I'm not here to apologize for the speaker. Trust me, the speaker, I can tell you from personal experience, can sometimes be a little difficult to work with. <laughs> but the governor has only made the situation worse. So just think, if I spent $10 million calling the city club and Jay Doherty a bunch of crooks, I think our relationship would suffer. I don't know if you'd be asking me to come back and and speak to you. But that's what the governor does with the speaker. 
What's really troublesome is that I know that the governor has the ability to compromise. I know he has the ability to see the big picture. So we saw this a couple weeks ago when he signed a bill that sponsored by Senator Raul, an anti-gun violence law that Republicans and Democrats put together. Here's part of what the governor said when he signed the law. This is, I'm quoting him. This was not easy legislation to pass. This took a lot of work for many months by many people. Many compromises, many new ideas is needed to be discussed and debated. It shows what we can do when we put our minds to it and decide to work together to solve problems and take a step forward. This is not an answer. This is a step in the right direction. That's Governor Rauner speaking. I couldn't agree with him more. That wasn't easy legislation. You can ask Senator Raul. There were Senate Democrats who felt the final product was watered down. We probably had the votes to try to jam additional provisions down the governor's throat, but we didn't do that. We didn't do that because we recognized the importance of coming together on this issue. And to the governor's credit, he too wanted to be part of addressing the issue of gun violence, and he wanted to do it in a bipartisan fashion. So what I don't understand is why the governor doesn't see the same opportunities in the budget proposals. There are cuts and reforms and changes that he could and should take credit for, but he won't. So it's very, very frustrating. We essentially have wasted two and a half years fighting over the state budget only to now be on the verge of the General Assembly taking control of the situation, enforcing a budget on the state because the governor will not engage. There's a cost that comes with that delay, and it's not just the threat of junk status from Wall Street. We've missed out on billions of dollars in revenue that could have paid our bills. Instead, they got dumped into the pile of IOUs and are uh, costing us an enormous amount of interest. We could have prevented the Medicaid lawsuit. We could have kept the Wells Center in Jacksonville, Illinois open to provide rehab services in an area that's in the midst of a heroin epidemic. The list of victims goes on and on. So I want to talk about uh, what happened early in the year. When Republican leader Christine Redonio and I unveiled the Senate's grand bargain in early January, our hope was to spur quick and bipartisan action. Leader Redonio, now former Leader Redonio, will never get the credit she deserves for her work behind the scenes to push us to a budget. The Senate's grand bargain effort was her idea. She came to me and said, let's see if we can do this. She stood up to the well-funded right wing of the Republican Party and openly talked about the need to raise the tax rate to balance the budget. Believe it or not, if it wasn't for her, there never would have even been the leaders' meetings that led to the House vote for the balanced budget. So I really want to thank her. As I said, it's a budget that's been shaped by input from Republicans. It would look a lot different if it, hadn't, if it had been Democrats only. So if the House can muster the votes for an override later today, the specific budget crisis will finally be over, but not our need to compromise and work together. A school funding overhaul still waits to be sent to the governor's desk and for him to sign it or for us to once again override him. I'd like to think Governor Rauner would see the opportunity it provides to honor his promise to change our worst in the nation funding system. So despite all the political rhetoric and theatrics, I do remain optimistic that we will get to the place where he signs it. I believe he does want to improve education. I'm optimistic because I heard what the governor said in signing the anti-gun violence law. I know that he can see the opportunities for progress when he chooses to. And I'm optimistic because I'm pretty sure the governor wears his seat belts. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd be more than happy to answer as many questions as I can. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And we have a number of questions. Really? Yeah, as you can imagine. And if anyone else has a question, just fill out your card, hold it up. I see we've got one over here, Amanda. 
right there. And um, they'll come up here. And we'll have the Senate President address your questions. It would be helpful if I could find my glasses. Okay. Very first question from Tom Donovan of Quantum Crossings. Can you please explain what junk actually means to our economy, both to the state, the city, and to individuals? Sorry, David. Senator Cullerton gets first crack at this. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for the question, Tom. It's, it's one thing I have to say is that we're not sure for when, we can't be positive because I don't think it's ever happened before. Let's think about that for a second. No state has ever gotten to that level. So obviously access to credit is critical for, for, for any government. And the, the, the embarrassment that we've already suffered internationally, which is totally self-imposed, to pass this budget, which as I described, is not a radical change to what we had been doing up until this time. So when the governor says he wants the House to not override the veto, there will be an immediate, immediate uh, downgrade from all rating agencies. And there's no backup. He hasn't called a meeting since December 6th. Think about that. When I asked for a meeting, he told the Republicans not to attend. And Redonio said, I'm going anyway. So this is kind of stunning that there's no alternative that's proposed. The, the, uh, uh, I'll just give you one other example about uh, borrowing, because this is relevant. One day, he mused, let's just have people vote to decide what their property taxes should be. They can just, a, f a certain percentage of people can put it on the ballot, they can just set their own property tax rate, whatever number they want. Well, I talked to a village manager from a pretty wealthy suburb who said, great, we'll have to notify the SEC. We can't borrow any money anymore because we can't guarantee that we can pay it back because the property taxes might just go away. These are the ramifications. And by the way, the governor's suggestion was never actually in a bill. You know, he didn't actually put it into a law that we could even introduce. So this is just really heady stuff, and um, uh, it has to be something that when the House debates today has to be on their mind. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, this is from City Club member and uh, City Club Governor Martha Jantho. Why isn't there any consideration of taxing retirement income, i.e., IRAs? Certainly, uh, tax, uh, w when we were trying to raise money, we considered a whole range of sources of revenue. And that was floated. <coughs> the governor ruled it out. You know, he did have some input into what he would allow for. He did, in fact, say he was for revenue. When he introduced his budget on February 15th, he had a, he had a line there for $4.6 billion worth of revenue. So he, he said he wanted us to raise money, but he, he would say, but certain areas are, are off the table. Most people don't even know that we don't tax retirement income in Illinois. So maybe if, we, if we're not going to tax it, we should at least advertise that so more people know about it, and maybe they stop moving to Florida because so, we have the same retirement income as Florida does. Um, this is from that demon from DePaul University, Marie Donovan, who's a chair of the Faculty Advisory Council, Board of Higher Education. Please tell me one thing today that I can share with my fellow faculty in higher ed that will give us hope that the legislature has not forgotten all that higher ed means to Illinois. First of all, uh, Garrett, I think uh, we're still paying in DePaul, aren't we, for your tuition? <laughs> and Josephine. So we got a couple of graduates from uh, DePaul. Well, specifically, when the House votes today, you'll know that the MAP grants are going to be fully funded for the first time, all right, in a long time. So the, the, the MAP grants 
For some people in Illinois and the Chicago area, MAP grants are the entire thing that they know about state government. It's the only thing they know about state government. And of course, it's not just money going to public institutions, but also the private institutions like DePaul. And obviously, the most uh, fundamental job of government I is to educate its people so you have an educated workforce. That's why Illinois is fundamentally so strong. We have a great transportation system. We have a great uh, educated workforce. And so uh, this, the universities have been hit the last few, the public universities have, have been hit the last few years. I want to say about 1.2 billion. Even in this budget, I believe there's a 5% cut from, from what they were. We're spending less money in this budget. Is it 10%? Uh, you know, that was the last minute change. We, we, we are spending less money in this year than we were in 2015. But the universities, having gone through what they've gone through, are happy to get it. They signed up in support of the bill that the Senate first passed uh, to get this process started. So it's fundamental. You can't be the education governor and veto a balanced budget. Okay. Uh, this is from Don Schollenberger with Barrett and Warner. How do you think working with Bill Brady will be as compared to working with uh, Chris Rodonio? Yeah. Well, first of all, Chris Rodonio was an independent uh, legislator this year. As I told you, she was fantastic. She stood up to the governor in the best interest of the Republican Party that she represented. So our members are very disappointed that uh, the governor treated her the way he did. We're very disappointed that, that, that she left. And we hope that uh, Rep Senator Brady uh, recognizes the support that, uh, that we would like to give him for his independence. And he hasn't been elected yet. <laughs> Remember, count those votes. Uh, <laughs> Senator, were you surprised at what uh, Chris Rodonio did? Was it a total out of left field, or did you have some inkling? Well, she, uh, every uh, we started this in December. Um, I've obviously, we got elected the nine years ago. We got elected the, 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 the same day, and we've been working together on, on the first thing we did was work on a capital bill, which was nine years ago. Passed that in, in the first ten weeks. It was a total bipartisan effort. The impeachment trial, remember that? Uh, that was something we worked together on immediately with, uh, with total respect for the system. Uh, she was more and more frustrated every, every day. We went to editorial boards back in January. We said, we have to vote on this right away. Let's get this over to the House, not the final product. <clears throat> and even some of our members who are here were very suspicious of her motives because, after all, she had run the campaigns against our members, right, up until November. But she was totally about policy, <clears throat> kept on. She was the one that had to go talk to the governor and his chief of staff, not me. Uh, and it was very, very frustrating. And you got more and more frustrating tor towards the end. Uh, we finally uh, just broke and passed a bipartisan budget with, with Democratic votes only. And so when, when she told me that she was leaving, it, uh, it, it wasn't as big a surprise. And I, I hoped, actually, I wished that she had just stayed a few more days because even the other day when we passed this tax, uh, uh, Senator Brady didn't vote for it, and she might have. Thank you. Um, this is from uh, Lawrence Massal with the Civic Federation. Senator, do you expect that even if the House overrides the governor's veto of the budget, that the General Assembly will still need to reconvene this summer to address Illinois school funding and other financial challenges? Yeah. Uh, Lawrence, thank you very much for your support, by the way, in, in uh, the business community. and in pushing uh, the Republicans who did support uh, this budget. I'm sure that your, your suggestions were, were heeded. Uh, the school funding bill is Senate Bill 1. The governor has said for some reason that he's going to veto it. Um, I believe that the Senate can easily override that bill, and perhaps the House as well. He, instead of being overridden for like the fifth time in the last week, he should sign the bill. The bill is necessary in order for the schools to be funded. So even though we would have a budget today, the schools don't get funded until Senate Bill 1 
passes. So that's how critical it is. And so we will have to go back down to Springfield again if the governor vetoes the bill. Now, with regard to the, the Civic Federation and the other business organizations, let me say that their suggestions on our tax uh, and our revenue was much higher than we actually passed. They actually suggested a tax rate of, of, of as much as five and a quarter. And the reason why they did that is because they wanted us to pay off some of these old bills. And, and just think about this. When the governor got elected, I believe that we owed about $3 billion, which is about a 30-day payment cycle. Now we owe close to $15 billion. We have to pay that back. We can't just, you know, we don't go bankrupt. We can't just say, oh, I'm sorry, we're not going to pay you. And I don't think the people are going to lend us $10 billion for nothing. And so it's all going to cost us. And so, uh, you know, when you, you, you might have read that um, the rating agencies were still going to read the bill and still question whether or not uh, we should avoid junk bond status, that's because we still have these debts we have to pay. And, and it's all a result of two years of intentionally not uh, helping us pass a balanced budget, and I, I blame the government for that. <coughs> sort of sounds like that old STP commercial, you know, pay me now or pay me later. Anyhow, this is from Ashish Sen, who's retired. First of all, this is a kudu, John. Thank you, Mr. President and the other members of the Senate here. I hope this afternoon we'll be able to congratulate the state. Now for his question. Would it have helped if the press did not focus so much on the conflict between two people, but on the substance of reforms? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the, trust is, the press is trying to stay in business, and they like conflict. And so uh, when, when you get asked questions, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I uh, cut a deal one time. Uh, she wrote a book with her family, and she wasn't getting it published. And I said, you ought to get your book published. And she said, well, you ought to go to an advisor, a media advisor. So I went to a – she published a book, and I went to a media advisor. And they told me, when they ask you questions, don't answer them. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not the way I was raised. You can't do that. So okay, well, don't answer me. Acknowledge the question, but then say something else. And I said, well, that still feels bad. But then in, I finally got around to understanding what he meant. They're not really asking you questions. <laughs> they want to get you to say something that's conflict. And so, yeah, they, they like to drive this whole narrative of, of a Rauner and Madigan, but of course, so does a Rauner. So, um, uh, you know, the way we communicate with people is much more complicated than it was when I first got elected. Uh, the, the one thing that we have done this year in our caucus is, you know, we've just come back to the basics. Uh, the other day after we voted for this and we had a caucus, people were just, we saved the state. That's what you get elected for, for Christ's sake. So who cares what the consequences are politically? At a certain point, you get to this, this crisis, you have to solve it, and that's what we did. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> we just have a couple more questions. Uh, this is from Jeff Jenkins, who's a sixth district voter, a CPS parent. I think he's the gentleman from Coonley School. Am I correct, Jeff? Yes, I am. Okay. And an LSC member, but it doesn't say you're a city club member. This is like pay to play. <laughs> 50 bucks will read your question. Um, as a matter of policy and practice, he says, you haven't been holding office hours for constituents. And he's very frustrated. He wants to know if you would uh, hold regular constituent office hours, if Tunney and Fritchie will let you. And he'd be happy to help organize. So if you need a volunteer, we're going to get that young man. Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, Jeff's uh, very active in Coonley School, which is a great school in my district, and I've been over there to speak to their local to the council. Jeff and I and about 12 other constituents had a meeting in my district office last, last week talking about this budget, and I think everybody in the uh, great schools we have in Chicago have been extremely frustrated 
uh, with, uh, with what's been happening. But we are on the verge, uh, and this is really important for Chicago. Senate Bill 1 corrects this long time anomaly of Chicago not having the state pay for the pensions. That's in the bill permanently. That's a huge, huge improvement that's in that bill. And secondly, we, we eliminate going forward with new money, any new money for education is run through a, a new formula, which is uh, progressive, which will benefit the poor school districts uh, throughout the state, most of which are downstate, but also Chicago will benefit as well. So they'll have the stability and the, the parents at Coonley who, who do a phenomenal job and, and, and as well as other schools in my district, they have to go out and raise their own money. And Jeff and his uh, local school council has been doing that to help just pay for the schools. Hopefully with this legislation that I talked about, uh, we, will, uh, we will be able to do that. And then when I have my district office hours, the parents can come over and congratulate me for passing that bill. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Our final question. Um, the legislature passed and the governor signed a bill this year that was uh, pushed by Senator uh, Kwame Raoul and many of the other senators here. I see Donnie Trotter, Maddie Hunter, and Toy Hutchinson and so on with um, Superintendent of Police Eddie Johnson. You worked very hard on that. The question really is, what do you think will be the next steps that the legislature will engage in to try to reduce gang crimes, murders, um, in the state of Illinois, you're dealing with upstate, downstate, you're dealing with suburban, urban, and that. How does one bring a coalition together on some of these issues? You know, this kind of reminds me of, uh, not to make light of this, but when I first ran for state representative, um, I was campaigning and I would accurately say that uh, I worked at the criminal court building at 26th in California, and that over a two year period, I had the highest conviction rate of any lawyer out there. Uh, now, it's also true that I was a public defender, um, <laughs> but, but I did learn about criminal justice system. If you Google uh, murders in Chicago in 1978, I think there was something like 970 or something like that. So we had uh, many years of great actual success in bringing down the fatality rate and the murder rate. But then, of course, it has, for various reasons, exploded once again. And so I just can't tell you much, enough about how, what a great job that Kwame Raoul did, because this is balancing. Um, <laughs> you, you have, you have an, an anomaly where we, there had to be an increase in sentencing, or at least in, in what the judges did, in sentencing folks who were just continuing to use these, these weapons. It's been this phenomenal influx of guns into the, the society that's, that's and the availability has been the, the, the real problem. At the same time, over those years, we had increased penalties in areas, that perhaps in, in nonviolent uh, drug offenses, that were perhaps disproportionate. And so, again, we had to work uh, and compromise, and that's what the governor did. That's why I mentioned it earlier. The governor signs the bill, recognizes you can't get everything you want, works on it all year, and he gets a win. I mean, why couldn't we do the same thing for the budget? So uh, once again, uh, it's, it's tragic. It, it ab absolutely adversely affects the image of Chicago, but you're not seeing any headlines about how it's two-thirds of what it was in, seven, in 78. That's, again, back to the issue of the conflict that the media kind of has to, has to thrive on. So um, we, once again, we'll see how this bill works. We'll see how it starts to affect uh, the sentencing for people who are, uh, use, use weapons. They will go to jail longer. They'll be off the street. And hopefully we'll start to see a reduction in the terrible fatalities that we've experienced in the city. Thank you, Senator Cullerton. Let's give the senator a round of applause.